My next author, I just finished her um, reading her novel, 10,000 Lungs. It's a fantastic uh, dystopian, uh, um, unpleasant pseudo reality. <laughs> um, she is the author of two novels and a bilingual children's book, including her recent 10,000 Lines. Please welcome magical realism, dystopian post apocalyptic fiction author, Kate Bitters. Well, I'm glad you liked the novel already, <laughs> but though, yes, there is some un unpleasantry in it. It's just the way I write. I don't know. I, I have a weird, twisted brain. But um, I guess I wanted to thank everybody for coming out and thank Kadia for hosting us. It's super awesome that they're willing to host something completely alternative. Although I see that there's national yodeling championships tonight, so I think, <laughs> I think they're all about the alternative. Um, <laughs> so, and thanks Conrad for all your hard work putting this together. Um, really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Up a little? All right. Okay. Um, before I start, I, I'll just do the, the plug. I have some books over there, too. I brought 10,000 Lines, which is um, my novel that came out this past spring. And um, I also brought Elmer Left, which is my first novel. This is really a departure from that one. The first one was literary fiction about an old man who runs away from home. Um, this is dystopian. It's about a worker bee type person who gains consciousness and kind of wakes up in the middle of an underground revolution. Um, and I'm not going to really tell you any more than that. I'll just sort of leave it at that. Um, and then for the the freebie, it's nothing fantastic, it's a piece of paper, but <laughs> what comes with it is um, my blog URL, and I'm going to be writing 52 stories in 52 weeks. Um, I'm saying that, so now I have to do it. <laughs> so if you want to pick up a little piece of paper, subscribe to the Bitter blog. Um, that will be my goal this coming year, 52 stories in 52 weeks. I have lots of ideas, so hopefully I can get them all written down. All right, um, I am just going to start from the beginning, page one of 10,000 Lines. On the glass, I trace the sun with my thumb. It sinks into the ground. Nightfall. Nightfall and everyone is asleep. They sleep as if yesterday had not happened. As if yesterday was a dream. I'm pretty sure it was not. I hold my thumb to the glass as if it's soaking up lingering rays, feeding them into my gray organs, tanning my gray skin. It's no use. My skin will remain gray. It was designed to be that way, gray and UV resistant, convenient, practical skin. I slide my thumb slowly down the window pane and listen to the scree on the glass. It isn't a loud noise, but the sound cuts through the silent air like the midday factory whistles, shrill and pervasive. I instantly regret making the noise and freeze my hand mid-slide. My shoulders tense, and I keep corpse still, listening for footsteps at my back, waiting to be caught. The footsteps never come, and the air around me continues to be saturated with a hundred sets of breathing lungs, a hundred shifting bodies, a thousand buzzing wires. I relax and lower my hands to my thigh. They are asleep. Just like any ordinary quiet night, they are asleep. I am not. I am awake. For the first time in my life, I am awake. I sit on the metallic ledge of the window, watching the horizon turn from dusty tan to brown to charcoal gray. I've never before watched the sunset. I've never had the chance or the interest. 
When it was bedtime, I went to bed. Everyone went to bed. We had to recharge to rejuvenate our bodies for the next day's work. Any trace of light is gone now. I have never seen the sky so dark. The dark is mesmerizing. It looks clean and immense. I'm used to shades of gray, not black. Never anything so black and deep. It keeps going, going, and then the stars are blinking like kids staring into the wind. I've seen this image once. Kids blinking, flying their kites as wind whipped around their faces. I laughed at the time, not understanding wind, not understanding children. I didn't bother much with the image then. It didn't trouble me. It was just another picture sliding across the screen, just another silly image to make the time pass. To be honest, I still don't fully understand them. The wind and the kite and the kids. They don't make sense in my world. They are foreign bodies, outsiders, like gravel in your shoe. I am familiar with that. It happened to me once when I was on the outskirts of the hive. I didn't know what gravel was until I was sent to the edge of the hive one time to retrieve a shipment of minerals. As I heard the train, I stepped away from the tracks into bits of tiny rock that framed the railway. I remember tripping, crying out. The overseer ran toward me, picked me up, asked me if I was okay. I said yes. He asked if I knew what I had stepped on. I said no. He said gravel, my worker. Those bits of rock are called gravel. Why would anyone make a surface so uneven, I asked. Well, that's what they did in the old days, he replied. We are better now. We don't have to deal with inconvenient things like gravel and uneven surfaces. That is good, I said, and carried on with my day. I might not have remembered the incident at all if bits of rock hadn't fallen out of my boots at bedtime. What is that? The worker in bed 24D asked. It is gravel, I replied. The overseer said so. Oh, said the worker in 24D, and we both climbed into bed. But tonight, I do not sleep. I cannot take my eyes from the depth of the night sky and the blinking stars. I cannot sleep because I am awake for the first time, aware of the stars and the dark, dark sky. I sit on the ledge for a long time, not sleeping, just watching and listening. The rhythm of the breathing bodies, the whir and chug of the recharge machines should lull me to sleep, but they do not. I can't think of sleeping when there's so much to see, so much to watch and listen to and absorb. In our hive, hive 14, there is no light during the late hours. Nobody is awake. Nobody walks down the streets. There is no need for light. No one would use it. But this night, the night of the blinking stars, I would have made good use of the light. I would have lit a path at my feet so I could walk down the level winding roads of Hive 14 and wander past the loading docks and see the factory when it shut down for the night. Perhaps it looks the same as it does in the daytime, but if I saw it, I would know for sure. As I think of these things, the darkness and factory at night and the lack of light during the late hours, I begin to wonder why I didn't think of them before. And then I wonder why I was asleep before yesterday. Asleep in a sense. Clearly I was functioning with my eyelids open and my body vertical, but I was seeing nothing. And then yesterday happened, and everything changed. I will not go back to sleep again.